Hey guys, it's that time of week again where we sit down and talk about Saul. Today we're talking about episode 3 of season 2. Today's episode, Amarillo. And yes, we're a day late. First time ever that we were a day late getting this out, but we're going to try to make up for it by being insightful. Definitely. Let's hope. Uh, the show starts with Saul and Amarillo. He is boarding a Sandpiper tour bus. The song that's playing is Waltz Across Texas by whoever. I don't know. Ernest the... Tubb. Ernest Tubb, yeah. There you go. Look at the big brain on you. I looked it up. <laughs> Basically what Jimmy is doing is illegal. You can't go speak to people to get them to file a lawsuit. They either have to come to you or you can message them through indirect means. Like media. Mailers, commercials. Which is such a weird law. It is kind of a weird law, but it keeps people from being harassed. I guess is the core. It's to protect old people, Chuck says later. The exact thing is called solicitation. So Jimmy uh, ends up signing pretty much the whole bus full of people, which kind of is illegal, but, you know, it's Jimmy. Uh, we next go to the board meeting where they're going through uh, the Davison, Maine, and Chuck's people are all together, and Chuck calls Jimmy out on it because Chuck's an evil bastard. And Jimmy talks his way through it. Pretty much. You can tell that the look on uh, Chuck's face says that, once again, he's not happy with Jimmy's decisions in life. He's a very judgmental man. He looked defeated and he angry. He's going to be a lot like you when you get older, I think. Yeah. What's really messed up about this is Chuck called him out knowing full well that Jimmy was doing this because in season one, episode eight, Jimmy outlined to Chuck how he was going to the mall and signing people. So Chuck already knew well before any of this. And at that point, he was okay with it. Only now that it Jimmy's doing well does he want to bludgeon him with it. Meeting's over. Not going to bore you guys with the details. Jimmy and Kim meet up. Once again, she's not happy. She put her ass out there to get him the job. Same thing we've heard for probably the last two weeks. Don't be a screw-up, Jimmy. <laughs> Next, we move to our first and only real Easter egg I caught in the episode. Mike is at his granddaughter's house, Kaylee, and Mike gives her a pig. The significance of that pig is what, you ask? What is it? Uh, season 5, episode 2 of Breaking Bad, Madrigal. Kaylee uses it to signal to Mike that there is a hitman in the house saving his life. So little did we know that this pig would later play a pivotal role in saving Mike's life. So there was your Breaking Bad Easter egg for this episode. We don't have any others. Back to the offices of Davis in Maine, where we see Jimmy running after Cliff, Cliff Maine. That's a weird name. Sure is. Uh, to discuss maybe doing a commercial as a way around the solicitation. Uh, Jimmy has it pinpointed to between 3 and 4 p.m. at 3.14 p.m., the first commercial break during Murder, She Wrote. He's well calculated, as always. It's one of the better moments of this episode of showing how, how his thought process works and how sharp he really is. And if maybe if he applied himself a little more, he wouldn't need to be crooked. I sound like Chuck. At this point, Cliff Main kind of gives him a brush off and says, okay, kind of do your thing. I'll be back in a week. That type thing. So Jimmy kind of takes the initiative on his own, and he brings back a couple characters from the Billboard episode in Season 1, uh, the guys that helped him do the response video to his billboard. Uh, they also bring back the little old lady from Alpine Shepherd Boy that got the whole ball rolling on this entire lawsuit. Uh, they shoot a commercial with her in black and white. We don't know that part till later. Uh, very cringy, very emotional, like every one of those commercials you see about old people being taken advantage of. I kind of glossed over it a while ago, but while I was so enthused about Mike giving the pig, I didn't really give you the reason he was at the house. Why was he? He was there to talk to his daughter-in-law, Stacy, about some gunshots. Well, actually, he was just visiting, and then she brought up gunshots outside the house. Uh, she told Mike not to worry about it, and no, he could not stay over. At this point, it's kind of nebulous if there, she's up to something or if she really believes there's gunshots. We cut to Mike. Uh, in the car, on a stakeout, eating his world-famous pimento sandwich and listening to the radio. You guys will never know how hard that little bit of information was to get to you. It took like six, six tries. Uh, anyway, around 2.13 in the morning, he starts hearing maybe gunshots. Turns out to be someone delivering the papers and the papers hitting the pavement and echoing through the city streets. Now, there, here comes a point of contention. Is this what Stacy was hearing, or was Stacy just completely making up a story? 
because she said two or three shots and he heard like ten. Yeah. What's your opinion? I think she's making it up to uh, so Mike will help them relocate. Get to a better house. Get to a better house. Okay. So Mike was here overnight. He knows what's up. At this point, Jimmy gets the commercial back, takes a look at it. It's very good, uh, very moving. He now has a decision to make. Does he run this commercial in Colorado Springs without running it by Cliff Main? Or does he take it to Cliff Main and go through all of the red tape to get it on the air? He knows it'll work. And this is, again, the fundamental. This guy in the like the last episode we talked about being a launching point. This is kind of the flaw or the, the reason that Saul Goodman exists. He sees the end point and he sees what can be gained. But he wants to take a straight line. He doesn't want to run through a maze to get to the end result. Which is pretty much what Saul Goodman does in a nutshell. This is another step toward him becoming Saul. He debates it. He sits at his desk, looks at the tape, even goes to Cliff Main's door and decides against actually taking it in. He makes the conscious decision to do the thing that he knows will get him the most trouble later. Cut to Mike at the vet. Our old friend the vet from uh, season one that got Mike his first real job, hooked him up uh, with Price, sewed him up when he came, got shot. Um, he told Mike that if he was going to ever make any real money, he was going to have to go next level with the jobs. Mike wasn't willing to do that. So he ended up taking a um, bodyguard job for $200. So cut to Mike taking the $200 bodyguard job. He, he doesn't want to go up a level and you know do anything really illegal. Uh, he's sitting in his little glass house under the bridge playing the troll when he gets a phone call from the vet saying that someone asked for him by name and it's some next level stuff to get the money. Uh, we'll get to who that was that called as the closing moment of the show. Uh, before we do that, though, we cut back to Jimmy, who is now sitting at his phone, waiting for the phone to ring. He went ahead and ran the commercial, 314 in Colorado Springs. He gets up, talks to the receptionist, or the, that's my best guess as to what that guy is. He's the guy in the middle yeah. running shit. Uh, talks to the receptionist, wants to know how the phone call layout works. He's waiting on the calls. It's past the time the commercial ran, no calls. He's starting to get nervous. He sits down at his phone. Very reminiscent of episode one of Better Call Saul, season one. Uno. Uno. He does the magic fingers to the phone. And then about three seconds later, the phone starts to light up. So magic fingers work for it. We now cut to Jimmy and Kim watching Ice Station Zebra later that night. I don't know the episode, but at some point during the, the run of Breaking Bad, uh, Badger is making a check out to Saul Goodman. And Saul tells him to make it out to Ice Station Zebra. And I believe he says something along the lines of, It's a legit company, I promise. We name it that for tax purposes. So everything in this show, there's always some kind of little hidden gem. Uh, pretty much Cliff Main is pissed. Calls back, tells him he's not pleased with the commercial. Jimmy tells him they got over 100-something responses. Cliff tells him to be in the office first thing in the morning uh, for a meeting with the partners. Sounds like he may be getting fired. I personally don't think he will. I don't think so either. Even though he went over their heads, it still worked out very well for him. Over their heads, around their backs, he did something. He he circumvented them one way or the other, most definitely. All right, uh, the show now ends with Mike having a meeting in a dirty warehouse with someone who is secret. My hope against hope, when they had the mystery figure, I was like, please let it be Gus. Come on, Gus. I guess it's too early. We won't probably get Gus to like season four or five. Probably. But no, no, it wasn't Gus. It wasn't even Tuco. It was Nacho. I don't know why they felt the need to have a big reveal other than this is the first time these two will have worked together. And it's Mike's entry point into the world of crime that ends up killing him. Spoiler. He said that after the spoiler, but... I know. It's all right. But if, you've, if you're watching this show, you probably already know what happened to Mike. Because it would be kind of weird if you didn't. Yeah. All right. Time to grade. What grade do you give this episode? An 89. I'll give it an 89. A B plus. B plus. I'm right there with you. Uh, B plus. Better than last week. I don't know why. I can't tell you any specific reason. Like I said last week, I thought last week's episode was really more of a base. 
The cobbler was a base. And with this episode, Amarillo, they built on it. They built a little more. You can actually see Jimmy making decisions that's going to lead to him having to go on his own. The decision to run that commercial without approval, even though he has a good job, I'm convinced by the end of this season he's going to be out of Davis and Maine. Gandhi. Mike is getting introduced into the lower levels of the Albuquerque crime scene at this point. And then, of course, we know that he's going to build up to being a pretty major fixer as time goes on. So this, this episode just really kind of built on the last episode for our mind. I think it's going to be a slow build all the way out to the end of the season where something like episode 10 will probably be like the big payoff. Sounds about right. Still no Saul this season. I don't see Saul tell. Not yet. At this point, the way they're building this, I call Saul at, get it? I yes. call Saul at midway through season three. Episode five, season three, here comes Saul. That's my guess. That's your guess? Wow. That's, that's a prediction. A, that's a bold guess because anybody that was smart that was doing a show would bring Saul out at the very end of a season to bring you back. Oh, yeah, you're right. My worry is that this show, they when they initially contracted this show, it was for two seasons. And I haven't heard it's been renewed for season three. Oh. That's okay, though. There's this thing called Netflix. Oh. Uh, and if they can bring back Full House, <laughs> you can bet they'll bring back Better Call Saul. Oh, yeah. So that's what we got this week. We promised to be on time next week. It was a hiccup, a flaw. Sorry. Yeah, one of those things. Thanks for watching. Stay vigilant.